Our presenters this evening are Malco Falco. He's a partner in the litigation department at Norkin Mains in Toronto, where he focused on civil appeals and applications for judicial review. Marco is a prolific legal writer and chief editor of the Talk in Maine's Legal Watch. He's also a chair of the firm's Diversity and Inclusion Committee. In 2020, Marco was recognized by Lexology as a legal influencer and nominated for Canadian Lawyers' Top 25 Most Influential Lawyers in Canada. Marco, thank you for joining us this evening and writing tonight's presentation. Thank, thank you so much, for Thank you. And Kathy Hayhow is a training and support specialist with LexisNexis Canada based over in Toronto. Kathy is a graduate of Osgoode Hall Law School and was a member of the Law Society of Upper Canada. For the last 10 years, she has enjoyed working with judges, lawyers, students and legal support staff to help them get the most from over 20 LexisNexis research products. Prior to joining LexisNexis, Kathy worked as a corporate trainer and also as a public school teacher. Well, we know we're in good hands tonight. Okay, so Marco, I'm going to hand over to you. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, it is a sincere privilege to be able to present for GLC this evening and for LexisNexis. So I'd like to thank all of you. Um, I realize and I am humbled by the talent um, that is before me this evening. So I certainly hope that you find this in, uh, as informative as possible. It is legal research, so I will do my best to make it as exciting as I possibly can for you. Um, I'm now going to turn off my camera as I proceed through the presentation. Um, and once we get through it, then Kathy will take over on her segment. So I will now turn my camera off. All right. So this evening, um, we're going to divide our seminar into five parts. The first part essentially takes you to some basics about doing legal research within Canada, within private practice. Um, and I have some key pointers that I just want you to bear in mind, following which um, Kathy is going to do a fantastic demo uh, where she's going to show you how to use the Quick Law tool to conduct your research and practice. After Kathy has spoken, you're back to me. And I'm going to discuss legal research in the context of three specific documents that you will be using in private practice, a legal memorandum, an opinion, and a factum. And then finally, I'm going to conclude with three or four of my best tips or best practices that I hope you're going to find useful when you are, in fact, um, practicing privately in Canada. So let's go through uh, the hierarchy um, of laws. Sorry or rather um, the fact that Canada is in and of itself a parliamentary democracy and a constitutional monarchy. Now, I'm not trying to bring you back to high school civics class. The reason that I bring this up is that you should have this hierarchy of Canadian law in the back of your mind every single time you are doing legal research. And what do I mean by this hierarchy of laws in Canada? Well, in Canada, if you can envision this as a pyramid, and I apologize, I wasn't techy enough to uh, draw an actual pyramid for you. But at the top of this pyramid is the Constitution, the Supreme Law of Canada. And that includes both the BNA Act of 1867 and the Charter. When you are conducting legal research, one of the first questions that should cross your mind is, is there a state actor involved? Um, should I be challenging state action, the Constitution or the Charter may very well come into play. Underneath that prong are what are known as quasi-constitutional statutes. And these are statutes that aren't just regular acts of parliament or the, or the provincial legislature, rather. Um, they're statutes that have a special status at Canadian law because they likely involve issues like human rights and liberty. And um, I'm specifically speaking about things like human rights acts um, or the criminal code, for example, that have a sort of quasi-constitutional status at Canadian law. If one of those applies, once again, you likely have a state actor that is on the other side of your dispute. The third prong in this hierarchy of laws in Canada is likely the one you're going to be most engaged with most of the time. That is an ordinary standard federal or provincial statute, an incorporated international treaty, meaning an international treaty that has been incorporated into domestic law within Canada or within the province, 
and regulations, which of course form part of the statutes themselves. And underneath that, if you don't have a particular statute that applies, is the common law. Um, and it sort of sits in the bottom, at the bottom of the ladder, because it is judge-made law. And unless the three other prongs necessarily apply, you're not going to be resorting simply to common law principles. Um, and if you want to take a very broad approach to common law, this can also include uh, judge-made law that interprets the statutes at issue. And then finally, at the bottom of this ladder or this pyramid are unincorporated international treaties. And these are treaties that never formed part of Canadian law, but they sort of hover in the background. And often they touch on very important issues like human rights, um, you know, in private international law, you could be dealing with the laws of service or of jurisdiction. All of these international treaties, unfortunately, in Canada, only have persuasive value because they were never incorporated into a domestic statute. So likely, as I said, most of what you're going to be doing when you're doing research in private practice in Canada involves statutory work and the interpretation of statutes. So where, if you are looking for statutes, do you go? Um, LexisNexis, and certainly within Quick Law, is an excellent source of all federal and provincial statutes. It is quite comprehensive. The official sources are, of course, the government sources. So if you're dealing with a federal act, you are going to look to the Department of Justice's website for the federal government, and then provincial uh, websites. I'm familiar with Ontario, so eLaws is what we call the statutory database of Ontario statutes in Canada. Okay, great. So you have this pyramid in the back of your head. Now, what do you do in order to start your research? The first and critical component of starting any legal research project is to understand that the facts and the equities drive the law. I know this is trite. I know you heard this in law school, and I'm sure, certain for those of you who are practicing that you've heard it in practice as well. But it is critical. You cannot start a legal research project without understanding your client's case. And what are the sources of information in order to get that sort of knowledge? If you're lucky enough, and there's already been some form of litigation, for example, then you're going to turn to things like pleadings and affidavits. Um, on the other hand, you may not be as fortunate, but there may be uh, things like correspondence, memoranda, and emails that you can, in fact, uh, look at. So once you've mastered the facts of your case, if you're looking at a research topic of which you have absolutely no knowledge, um, you turn to what I consider to be the encyclopedic textbooks. Um, Halsbury's Laws of Canada is an excellent source, also available um, on Quick Law. And this allows you to get a sort of 30,000 foot view of a particular legal topic. I find this particularly useful when I'm engaging in a legal topic of which I know absolutely nothing. And I just need to learn basic first principles and the fundamentals of a particular area of law. In such cases, Halsbury's is an excellent source. Another great source are articles, articles published by other lawyers. Um, and you can find these through a variety of sources, through various search engines. The Lawyer's Daily is an excellent publication that provides you with daily updates on legal issues across the country and is also available on Quick Law and worth looking at. Now, if you already have a sense of the area of the law that you are looking at, and in fact, um, you, you already know it, you've known it for years, consult specific textbooks within the practice area that you are researching. Um, one example that I believe Kathy may, may take you to is Sapinka, Letterman and Bryant, The Law of Evidence in Canada. So if you have an evidentiary issue, go to the specific textbook if you can, because of course, these textbooks are likely to be written by the authorities in their field, and separate and apart from that, they're going to be comprehensive. Now, one thing that you will have noticed um, after discussing the pyramid, after discussing your mastery of the facts of the case, is that I immediately turned to textbooks. Textbooks still should be your starting place. Now that most of them are available electronically, particularly, particularly in the pandemic through various resources, 
make textbooks your friend. They are critical to starting a research topic. It doesn't matter where you are um, in, in the process of researching. If you haven't looked at a textbook, I promise you, you are going to miss things and you're going to miss critical and key cases and principles. The next thing you want to ask is, going back to the third prong of that hierarchy that I showed you, is whether a statute or alternatively an incorporated treaty, an international treaty that has been incorporated into domestic law in Canada, applies to your case. And if it does, a great source of information is an annotated statute. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with this, I apologize if this seems rudimentary, um, but knowing, for example, um, that you can go to a specific provision within Ontario's Family Law Act, and there's a series of cases that are going to begin your path in researching a particular issue, um, proves to be particularly convenient. So if there is an annotated statute in your practice area, I strongly urge you to make use of it. Um, and of course, it, it goes without saying, and I don't know actually why I put the second point there, but obviously make sure that you're using the most up-to-date version of your statute and not something from 30 years ago, for example. Another good source of law is American law. Um, remember, however, that in Canada, American law only ever has persuasive value. It is certainly not binding under the principle of stare decisis in Canada, um, and in specific practice areas, and I do believe, don't quote me on this, but I do believe there is a Supreme Court of Canada decision from long ago that states that in the area of insurance law, for example, if there isn't a relevant Canadian authority on point, you can turn to the American authority um, to interpret a particular provision of a policy um, with respect to certain benefits and so forth, naturally because um, there's a much larger population down south, and so as a consequence, they have many more cases. Um, but on the whole, remember that, of course, if you are going to use American law, it is only ever going to have persuasive value. Um, the other thing that I do want to say about American law um, is that you should understand the hierarchy of the U.S. court system. If you're going to try to persuade a Canadian court, for example, to adopt a principle uh, from an American case, I strongly suggest that that case comes from the Circuit Court of Appeals uh, within the United States or the American Supreme Court, just because they will largely have um, more authority. Uh, simply because they are higher level courts. Okay, what about other common law jurisdictions? What about the United Kingdom? Once again, non-binding in Canada. Um, having said that, we do rely quite a bit, particularly if you are trying to persuade a Canadian court to change the law in Canada or to address a legal issue that has never been addressed before at Canadian law, then turn to, by all means, Australia, India, South Africa, any of the common law jurisdictions, because we do rely um, on their jurisprudence. I do remember when I was a young law student, um, I had the fortune of working uh, with Pro Bono Students Canada on a same-sex marriage case. And same-sex marriage at the time was a novel concept at Canadian law. So of course, we had to turn to the common and constitutional laws of other common law jurisdictions, which helped us win our case ultimately on the particular facts. So I would not dismiss other common law jurisdictions. They have significant relevance, but the relevance is largely confined to those circumstances where you are trying to develop or evolve Canadian law in a particular direction. And of course, UK decisions are available um, on the Quick Law database as well, if you, if you have the subscription to do that. Okay, so you've now looked at textbooks, you've looked at foreign law, you've looked at all the secondary sources that you can. My view is that now is the time to jump onto Quick Law and start your actual uh, research. I wouldn't recommend in nine times out of 10 just jumping onto a, a legal database. The point is to go onto the database to find your secondary sources first, and then you can start looking up primary sources of law. And how do you do this? Well, you start to look at the footnotes within your textbook, and then you start to look at the cases that are cited, and that is just the starting point. At that point, for the purposes of private practice research, 
one of the key and most critical things you can do is begin to note up your cases. So on uh, LexisNexis and on QuickLaw, this is actually quite easy to do. Um, and it's through a tool called QuickSight. And if you're not familiar with QuickLaw, they have these amazing symbols, um, a red X, which means that the decision that you are relying on has in some way been overturned or seriously questioned by another Canadian court, usually an appellate court above it. Um, and then they have the uh, little cautionary exclamation mark uh, within a triangle, which means that the case has somehow been distinguished. And then they have this little swirl, um, which largely means your case is safe and has only ever been considered in a positive way. Remember, of course, that when you are noting up decisions, appellate courts obviously have more authority than the lower courts. So if you are relying on a particular decision in your research, you have to make sure that the Supreme Court of Canada, for example, has not overruled the decision on which you want to rely. Now, one of the uh, frequent uh, questions that I get from younger lawyers is what do I do with these cases that have been distinguished, that have received some form of cautionary treatment? The question is this, you may not in a 300 page note up be able to sit there and sift through every single decision. Um, that would be time consuming and likely not uh, in the interests of efficiency or your, or your client's interests for that matter. So what you wanna ask yourself are questions like, what factual distinctions am I actually looking for within the cases? And are the legal principles on which these particular cases um, that have been decided, are those legal principles the same as the ones that I want to rely on in this case? If so, then that cautionary distinction may very well be relevant. Okay, so you've read your secondary sources, You've now read your primary sources on Quick Law. You've noted up all your cases. What do you do? In the process of noting up and reading your primary sources, start to organize your law. And I say this whether you're going to be um, doing research for any of the three documents that we're going to be discussing this evening, a factum, an opinion, or in fact, just a basic memorandum. In all of those cases, you want to organize your law. How you do this within the folders function of Quick Law is entirely up to you. I have a personal preference of usually sorting my cases by cases that will have a completely negative impact on my client's position and cases that, in fact, will help us win our case. Um, I like to sort of divide these in these good and bad piles um, in keeping them in that sort of binary in my brain. Um, it helps me to understand how likely our client will be at having a successful case on the merits. And so I think this is a critical thing to do before you ever take pen to paper for any of the documents. So I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Kathy, who is going to take you through a quick law demonstration. And she's going to show you how you can apply some of the techniques that I have um, actually explain to you now. And then once we do that, you're going to return back to me and I'm going to discuss legal research vis-a-vis -vis the three documents that you typically need legal research for in litigation and private practice. Great. Thanks, Marco. I'm just going to share my screen here. I'll make sure everybody can see my quick law landing page. I hope that's uh, everybody can see that now. Um, yes, just as Marco said, we don't have time for a, a full demo here, but I'm going to give you a nice overview of the Quick Law landing page because so many of the um, the content uh, topics that Marco just mentioned are very quickly accessible. So the landing page, of course, in Quick Law, you have all the primary sources of law, the legislation, the case law, plus all those handy secondary sources, as you just mentioned, that where you're going to start your research. All this content can be surfaced through this red search box. It's an intelligent red search box. You can do a keyword search. Um, you can search by people's names. You can search by case citation, by topic, all kinds of different ways, um, or do a Boolean command language search, multi-intelligent search box. Notice it's designed to search all of that content at once. So you can capture everything. And if you look over here on the left, you can peek underneath the Canadian flag and you could 
access the um, American collection here or the UK if you need Privy Council decisions. All of it is just uh, accessible right from that red search box. Below that, to make it a little bit easier to find certain content types, the Explore Content Portal has been set up with quick links to help you surface that in independent uh, top content separately. So here's a link to Halsbury's Laws of Canada. Imagine that as a hundred topic encyclopedic volumes sitting on the shelf. As you recall, that's what Marco suggested is a great place to start for that high level overview of that area of the law. What's the relevant terminology used by the court? It will point you to some leading cases in the, the footnotes. Is it a legislative issue? It will let you know what piece of legislation applies. So that's a great starting point. Then your commentary and textbooks, you can surface the whole list of what you have access to on Quick Law through this link, or you can do a quick look up in the box here and it will find, um, I think Marco mentioned Sapinka's Laws of Evidence, that probably that is the most cited textbook by the Supreme Court on evidence law. There it is there, my source filter looked it up so I could open it by clicking on the title of that book, the table of contents view. Over, once you've done your reading and you know your facts and you've done all your reading, that's you're also going to check your legislation. So you can browse legislation from right across Canada here. And there's a nice link here that's going to pull up all the collections of annotated le legislation available on Quick Law. <laughs> As Marco said, you want to make sure that you're in the current version. So there are consolidations for the, um, the statutes, the rules and regs, as well as you if you're doing historical research, you can access that through these quick lookups here. Then once you wanted to get into your primary sources of law, you can pull up individual collections here, your court decisions, your tribunals, your etc. But I'll just point out that all of that content could be captured at once if you did your search through this red search box and you could navigate to all that with a few clicks from a results list view. So below this explore content, I'm just going to scroll down, Lawyers Daily. <clears throat> this is the publication that Marco uh, mentioned where it's your current awareness product. What's going on? What you hear it in the news uh, yesterday, you're going to probably read about it in the next day or two in the Lawyers Daily. Uh, lawyers from leading firms contribute articles to this platform as well as our internal editors. And there's an RSS feed right on the homepage of Quick Law where you can go in and read all these stories as they're posted. A lot of people sign in every day just to see what's new on the Lawyers Daily. If I clicked on a story, it would take me out to that actual publication. Lots of customization available on Quick Law so you can make your ID user friendly for you. You can set up sources that you use often. If I'm going to search the securities reporter often, I can make it a favorite and click it right away. And here's your folders tool. As Marco mentioned, it's really handy when you find a great document that's on point, you can customize your folder collection, throw your documents in there. And then if you sign in anywhere, even remotely, all your documents will be in one nice place. Now, we can't go into a lot of detail, as I mentioned, from uh, the time constraints here, but down here on the right, the support portal, notice that you can sign up for a training session at any time. Training on Quick Law is always complimentary. I believe you'll receive an email after this session. There will be links to that content. There's a documentation and a tip sheet page. Service at is a, a chat line and there's a help number. So there's always help available when you're using Quick Law. So with that high level overview, I will pass it back to you, Marco, to go on with the rest of the, now the drafting. Great, now for the, now for the boring part. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Um, I'm in awe at the amount of knowledge that you have about these topics. Um, I feel like I should actually, you should be running the rest of this. Um, so thanks a lot. Um, I am going to share my screen. Sorry, bear with me. I am turning my video off again. Okay, so let's go to part three of this, which is the first document that you are likely as a young lawyer to be drafting in Canadian practice and in private practice rather, and that is a legal memorandum proper. So why am I talking about legal memos? You've probably done them before. You certainly did them in law school and you may have done them uh, when you worked as a lawyer previously. Remember that a legal memorandum is not a piece of written advocacy. You are discussing all aspects of the law, the good, the bad, and the ugly, everything that's wrong with your case and everything that's great about your case. Um, you need to discuss both. And this is the first step in constructing a good legal argument that ultimately, um, with a view to the idea that this will be the legal argument that's going to be advanced 
in litigation at some point. So it's okay in a legal memorandum to say you don't have a shot at something or you do have a shot at something. Now, I'm going to make a very broad generalization and, and um, I welcome anyone to correct me on this. In Ontario, because I can't really speak for practicing in, in, in other provinces in the country, um, a legal memorandum generally in private practice has the following format. Um, I strongly urge our young lawyers not to deviate from this format uh, at our firm when, when constructing a memo, just because I find it, it's tried, tested and true, and, and it, it brings a certain value. The first thing that, or the first part or structure of this legal memorandum are the facts themselves. And I usually confine this to about four to five paragraphs maximum. Um, you're not retelling the tale to the lawyer who is likely the audience of a legal memorandum that is a senior lawyer uh, within the firm in which you are practicing. You're not gonna retell the whole sordid tale. You just wanna get to the relevant facts that will um, be addressed later on when you're in the conclusion section and you are applying the law to the facts. So it's not a, a dissertation by any stretch. It is not a pleading. It is not an affidavit. It is four to five paragraphs of the most important cogent facts um, that you can contain within your particular memorandum. The second part are typically the issues. And this is a sort of junior lawyer mistake that I made countless times. Um, I wanted to impress the senior lawyer. So I would make my questions, the issues that I was asked to research, very complex. I would use many polysyllabic words. I would use Latin and legal terminology just to impress them. It was the worst mistake I ever made as a young lawyer. Keep your questions simple. The more difficult you make the, your questions, the more difficult they are going to be to answer. Um, so if you ask a series of simple questions in your research memorandum, you will be able to provide simple answers. And that's the key. The conclusion section, which we will come back to, is the very last section that you are going to draft. And um, once you've set out the legal issues that you need to examine, I would park the conclusion section for a while until you get to the analysis. And in the analysis section of a memorandum, what you are doing is number one, setting out the general principles, the legal tests, the underlying philosophy and policy behind the legal issue. Um, typically what you're citing in this section are decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada and decisions of appellate courts across the country. Um, and then you can discuss your case law. How you wish to organize this is up to you. When I was younger, I typically liked to say, um, you know, these are the cases that will undermine our client's position, and these are the cases that will favor it. I've shifted gears over the years um, to sort of address circumstances where a particular legal issue was or was not applied. There's no magic to this. It's what you're comfortable with. Um, but I would organize it, it by category and certainly by using subheadings. Once you've done all that work, you can now go back to the conclusion section. What distinguishes an excellent legal memorandum from a mediocre one is that in an excellent legal memorandum, you are providing your opinion as a lawyer or as a law student. And a lot of younger lawyers are particularly timid about giving an opinion because they don't want the lawyer who's going to read this ultimately to think that they're not smart. I will say this, I am far more impressed by a legal memorandum where the lawyer has given me an opinion that I don't agree with than to have none at all, where I'm sort of left thinking about it myself and I have a sense of what the law says, but I don't have someone prodding me in a particular direction. And the questions you want to ask yourself, ultimately in the back of your head, is does your client have a case? Would you be able to argue this legal issue in court? And what are the legal obstacles? What are the challenges to your legal argument that could undermine it, so such that you may not have any possibility of advancing it at all? And the contrary position is, of course, what are the merits of your particular case on the law and what legal arguments will help you advance your client's case? 
Okay, so that is the first prong, which is a legal memorandum. The other typical document that you will be asked to produce in private practice in Canada is a legal opinion. The legal opinion is typically not designed for other lawyers in your firm. Nine times out of 10, it is designed for your client. And so you have to bear in mind the audience that you are writing for. Um, and this is key for a legal opinion. You may have a very sophisticated client who in fact has a law degree and will understand everything that you were talking about when you talk about Rylands and Fletcher, or you talk about piercing the corporate veil. They will get those concepts because they understand them. On the other hand, your client might be a business person who has absolutely no knowledge of the law in the slightest, in which case you frequently have to keep these sorts of opinions less formal. And the point there is to extract legal jargon, extract legalese away from the opinion, and write in plain speak. It's a very difficult task. Um, trying to explain what a tort is, let alone duty and standard of care and negligence to a non-lawyer is a challenge, but somehow you have to get that done in a legal opinion. The other thing about a legal opinion that you need to remember is that it is not a piece of written advocacy. So it's perfectly okay in a legal opinion to express the view to your client that there is a likelihood that you will not succeed um, or that your case doesn't in fact have any merit. Um, this is the time to do it. These legal opinions are protected by privilege. And so this is the time to tell your client whether you think they have a shot. So in terms of the content of a legal opinion, you want to set out once again, both positive and negative cases. You want to set out the facts. You want to apply those facts to the law. And most important, this seems rather trite, is that in a legal opinion, you should offer an opinion. The client is looking at you to do an assessment of risk. And that is how you have to fundamentally view a legal opinion. Um, my sort of best practice tip on this is never to offer a numerical percentage of success for your client's case. Um, I find that that can be an unmitigated disaster. It can commit you to numbers that you never intended. I stray away from it. Um, even if I have a client who is particularly concerned about their issue and tries to pin me to a number, I typically won't offer it. Instead, in a legal opinion, what you're going to do is to couch it in the rhetoric of risk. And that means using terms like likelihood of success, very likelihood of success, that the success is probable, that it is unlikely, that it is improbable. Um, to couch it in those types of adjectives gives the client a good sense of the merits without um, sort of the silliness of a statistical analysis, because as you know, Every case turns on its equities. Every case turns on its particular facts. And we do not have crystal balls. We don't know how the judge is going to assess the merits of our client's case. And no matter how convinced our client is, or we are, in the rectitude of their particular position, um, we may not know, in fact, what that, num what that amounts to in terms of a numerical value. So again, I'd be very cautious about providing any sort of percentages of success. Once you've drafted your legal opinion, one of, the, um, one of the sort of things that I've learned over the years is to pick up the phone immediately after you send it, tell the client, I'd like you to read it, and I'd like to have a follow-up discussion with you about it. Um, invite questions from the client. The reason being that even if your client is particularly sophisticated, as you all know, um, trying to convey tone and your understanding of the knowledge as applied to the law um, is frequently lost on paper. And that's not to say that, you know, if you're an excellent wordsmith, that's great. And you can convey those sorts of things. But I often find that a follow-up call to A, address any legal questions that the client may have, and B, to give them a sense of my view of the merits of their case through a conversation, I think goes leagues uh, beyond just sort of submitting a legal opinion by email and saying, good luck, let me know how you want to proceed. And this takes us to um, the final and perhaps the most important document 
that you will be drafting um, as a lawyer and as a litigator in private practice. And that is the factum. The audience for a factum shifts away from the client and away from other lawyers to the trier of fact, be it an arbitrator, a judge, a panel of judges. And you have to bear in mind that a factum is essentially a piece of oral advocacy. Why am I saying this? Because the goal is to use rhetoric in order to persuade your audience about the merits of your particular position. So one of the best um, pieces of advice I had from uh, one of my partners, the head of our civil litigation department now, is to take your legal issues and imagine as if you were writing for a, 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 a classroom full of children. Not because we are trying to demean um, the audiences who will read these facta, they are the most intelligent and brightest of our profession. Um, but because when you write in simple terms, you come across um, as particularly persuasive, um, you know, there, there is some merit to the axiom that, you know, brevity is the soul of wit. And it's absolutely true. That means using simple language. Well, that's easy to say, but when you're talking about statutory accident benefits under the Ontario Insurance Act, it's hard to use simple language. And I'm, there's a difference between being simplistic and being simple. Um, persuasive rhetoric means, and this, again, was given a great advice given to me long ago by Ron Maines, one of the founders of our firm, who said, take away every single adjective in your factum and let me see how it reads then. And it's amazing. Um, when you start to minimize the amount of adjectives that you use and adverbs, I might add, um, within a factum, you start to realize how much more persuasive your argument becomes because you've removed all of the bombast from the factum. Um, you don't look like over-the-top counsel that's, you know, sort of reaching for bigger words and grandiose drama in order to persuade them. Rather, what you're doing is you're trying to persuade the judge on the logic and the merits of a cogent argument. Once again, not saying to keep things simplistic, but to keep them simple because the more complex they are, the more unlikely you are to persuade them. The moment that your trier of fact is confused, you have a problem in terms of good advocacy. So one of the things that you have to sort of step back before drafting a factum is to ask yourself, what is the goal of my factum? Am I trying to win a procedural point? Am I trying to succeed, for example, on a motion for substituted service of a statement of claim? Something very procedural, very technical. On the other hand, Am I trying to deal with the substantive merits of the case? Is this a summary judgment motion? Is it basically the written equivalent of a trial? If so, how am I going to structure the case? I'm going to be doing more storytelling, that's for certain, than if my factum were geared towards a procedural point. On a procedural point, I'm likely not trying to persuade the judge so much about the equities of the case. I'm just trying to tell them what happened and this is how I served my particular statement of claim and will you kindly allow me to substitute service? Um, when I am telling about the substantive merits of the case without um, going over the top, I am trying to persuade the judge's heart and mind. The last type of factum is a very legal factum. Um, this is the type that I'm more familiar and more comfortable with, to be honest, mostly because I practice in appellate litigation. Um, because frequently I'm trying to either change the law or establish a principle of Canadian law. And in that particular case, while the merits are essential and the facts of my client's case are essential, even more important than that is what is the law and how am I going to move the court into a particular direction that I want them to move into if they are going to make a statement about the law or change the law in summary judgment or the duty of honest contractual performance, which has gotten a lot of leverage in the past few weeks by the Supreme Court of Canada. There's a way to design a factum in that particular case where you might actually begin by discussing case law instead of even the facts of your client's case. So again, this is unfortunately, and I do apologize for this, but this is a very Ontario centric um, presentation only because this is what I typically practice in. 
So what are the typical components of a factum in Ontario? Generally, there is the overview. Like the conclusion section of your legal memorandum, the overview is the thing you should draft last. Um, a lot of people will tell you, I like to draft my overview first because it provides me with a skeleton of where I'm going in my factum and it gives me direction. I think that's fine as long as you promise yourself to come back to it after you've done your analysis. I think it's critical um, that you do the overview and that is the last thing you touch because it is the most important part of the factum. Um, it is usually only two to three pages long. It is in a summary of your entire case and it's where you have to make your elevator pitch to get the judge's attention. In the first sentence of the overview, um, a lot of people will disagree with this. There are some who believe that you should begin with dramatic sentences and, and talk about the equities of the case and so forth. But I've attended enough seminars with um, judges at the Ontario Court of Appeal and at the Ontario Superior Court to tell you that in the first sentence, they typically want to know why you are in court. And it seems simple, but a typical sentence like, the appellant brings this appeal seeking to um, appeal the judge's motion or ruling on a summary judgment order. Um, let's the court know why you were there and what you want. And I think that level of clarity, as unappealing as it may be from a rhetorical perspective, gives the judge comfort that you know what you're doing and you know why you are there and what you are looking for on behalf of your client. We then move on to the facts section. Now, remember that the facts section of a factum is not a pleading, it's not an affidavit. You're not there to tell every little aspect of the story. You are there to persuade and you are there to pick the most important pieces of evidence. You do have to tell it in the context of a narrative. That is, again, you are trying to appeal to the equities, to the judge's heart. And so you do have to tell a persuasive story. Um, that being said, you don't have to necessarily provide every single detail. Um, and again, you want to tell the facts in the most favorable um, perspective of your client's position or to advance your client's position. rather. In terms of the evidence, you want to decide carefully. If I'm going to be citing transcripts, how many quotes am I going to have? Um, I find that a fact section that's littered with way too many uh, transcript resources becomes unpersuasive. It's exhausting. No one wants to read single line by single line of lengthy passages of evidence. Keep it short. Focus on the admission that you want to show to the judge that proves that your client's case has merit. Um, but don't necessarily, you know, um, necessarily regurgitate like paragraphs and paragraphs of evidence. Um, it's not persuasive and it's not a good way to, um, to, do, to draft FACTA. If you're dealing with a corporate commercial matter, you want to cite only those key provisions of the contract and the correspondence. Again, you don't want to be giving the judge so many irrelevant sections of your contract. You want to focus in on this case is about section 2.4 of this particular agreement between the parties. And here is what 2.4 says. And if I find that section 2.4, for example, is particularly long, I will use ellipses and truncate that and get rid of all the irrelevant parts and go to the heart of the provision of the contract that I am asking the court to interpret. The next part of a factum typically involves um, a discussion of the issues. As with your legal memorandum, keep those questions simple for the court. Don't make them overly long. Don't use legalese. And the other rule of thumb is if you have generally, and this is a broad rule, so I appreciate there are exceptions, but generally if you're discussing more than three legal questions, you're giving the impression to the judge that you don't know what your case is about, um, that you're throwing spaghetti against a wall and you're hoping that one of your arguments will stick. That won't persuade a court. Your best argument comes first and that is the one or two or three issues that you should focus on for the court. Don't give a court a factum with 10 legal issues because it will leave them utterly perplexed. The law. Now, for each question that you've just asked, 
I like to answer the question in the form of a subheading that advocates for my client's position. So um, if the question is, for example, should summary judgment be granted in this particular case, then my subheading A will be summary judgment ought to be granted in this particular case or, or some rendition of it. Um, so again, put your best argument first. You've got to get them right at the beginning. Put your weakest argument at the end, um, because by that point, the judge is either persuaded or not persuaded by your particular argument. There may also be, before you actually head into the legal issues you've identified, some preliminary housekeeping in the law section. That involves issues like discussing on appeal what the standard of review may be, um, or if you have a judicial review application, for example. It may also be the point where you can set out the legal test by the Supreme Court of Canada. If it's an injunction, for example, this is where you want to cite RJR McDonald. The remainder of the law is an act of persuasion, and that is the actual application of the law to your client's case. There are some lawyers that simply list a series of legal principles and don't make the argument. That is a fatal flaw, in my view. I would never do that. Um, you have to tie the facts back to the law for the benefit of the judge. I think I made that point. And then the last part of your factum is typically the relief requested. Um, it's a more detailed version of the first sentence of your factum. Why are you in court and what are you asking the master, the arbitrator, the judge to do? What do you want? And you should be able to answer this in one sentence or two maximum. The other thing that you may want to ask for, it's a bit of an anachronism in Ontario, and I'm not certain if it's done in other jurisdictions across the country, is to ask for the costs of the proceeding. We typically do. Um, I'm not sure that if you don't ask for them, you won't get costs in your particular proceeding. Um, but as a sort of good practice, I essentially do that. In terms of schedules, in Ontario, we have Schedule A, which is a list of all the cases that you're relying on. Schedule B are all the statutory provisions. Um, with the pandemic, these should be hyperlinked. It just makes it easy for the court if they need to look up your particular decision and see what you are actually arguing and whether it has merit. So I strongly suggest uh, hyperlinking as a matter of practice, uh, the schedules that go at the end. Once you finalize the factum, basic tips. Proofread, check all your footnotes, make sure you haven't left any highlights. I'm guilty of this all the time. I've read through a document, I'm about to submit it, and then suddenly I've realized I've highlighted something for myself and left it there. You definitely don't want opposing counsel to see that. Um, and then, of course, right before my factum goes into court, I will frequently ask a younger lawyer or a student to note up my cases. Why? I want to make sure that none of the decisions that I've actually cited in my factum have not been overruled by an appellate court since the time that I did my legal research, which often can be many months before. Um, the most embarrassing thing that you could do is rely on an appellate decision only to find out that the Supreme Court of Canada overturned it the week before you submitted your factum, and you did not bring this to the judge's attention. So very quickly, best practices in terms of legal research and drafting. First of all, understand what the goal of your research is. Are you trying to do an assessment of both the positive and negative aspects of your client's case? Or are you writing a piece of advocacy? That's going to direct the whole process and what's in the back of your mind when you're doing your research. Read, read, read. Before you draft, read as much as possible. Read secondary sources before you read primary sources. Go to textbooks, go to secondary articles. Then when you have those articles and you know what the leading statutory provisions and cases are on your particular case, that is when you can take pen to paper and begin to draft. Use quick sight as often as possible. This has now become pretty much a professional obligation. Um, you could be accused of misleading the court if you haven't in fact uh, drawn a particular case to their attention that is the leading case on an issue, even if it hurts your client's case, 
Or alternatively, you've relied on a case without indicating to the court that it was subsequently overruled. It may very well have been overruled on a point that is not material to your particular discussion, but that's of no moment. You should still draw it to the court's attention. You have an obligation to do so as a lawyer. Don't reinvent the law, particularly if you are drafting a factum, and this is not... Um, I am in no way advocating that you plagiarize uh, and you do not give due credit to authors and so forth by any stretch. All I'm trying to say here is that when you are citing a legal test, for example, don't reinvent the language. It will undermine your credibility. The RJR McDonald test uh, for an injunction is serious issue to be tried, balance of convenience, irreparable harm. Don't reinvent those words for the court. The court doesn't want you to do that. They want to know what the legal test is that they have to apply as mandated by the higher courts. So with all that said, I'm turning my video on. I'm going to stop sharing. I sincerely hope that was informative. And I think I'm going to turn it back to Siobhan, who uh, may have some questions for Kathy and me. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, there's been a flood of questions coming in. Please do get them in. We are now in our official Q&A part of this session. Um, I've been trying to answer some of them whilst you've both been talking. I've done a terrible job. I am not a litigator, so I apologize for making everybody extremely confused. There are three types of legal documents we were talking about today. They all have a different purpose. They all have a different audience. But one of the questions, Marco, that came up, and this is probably because of me, who knows, I'm going to take the blame for it anyway, is why would a factum be distributed internally within a law firm? And if it was distributed in a law firm in, internally, would you change the way you present it because of that? That's actually an excellent question. So one of the things that I didn't mention in my presentation, I, I think I was running out of time, is I will frequently, after drafting something, give it to one of my colleagues. More important, because I'm lucky enough to work in a large firm with a superb litigation department, I will give it to our particularly bright associates, alternatively to very senior lawyers, and I will tell them, I want you to be 100% candid. And some of them will, and it will involve me going back to the drawing board and sometimes starting from scratch and realizing I've messed this up entirely. Um, that's okay. We all make mistakes when we draft. But that peer review, if you have the opportunity to do so um, and have someone else look at your work, even if it's someone who doesn't have the same level of expertise as you, as I said, I'll rely on a really bright associate who I admire and respect to read over something I've drafted and I want their honest opinion. Um, and I will get that. I don't care that I may have more experience. We're all capable of making mistakes. The other great thing is by having someone do that, they're in essence also proofreading. Um, and if your brain works any way like mine does, my brain will complete the errors that I've made in terms of typos, grammatical errors, they will fill them in. So when I'm reading my own work, I will never notice my, my typos. Um, having someone else do that for you is amazing. And if you have that opportunity, I strongly recommend it. Such a good tip. It's so true that when you're looking at a document for so long, you just gloss over the, the small things. Like you put the E and the I the one, wrong way around. You like miss an O in a word. But every time you look at it, the word looks perfect every time. So, yeah, having that. So I think hopefully that answers your question. Um, everyone who was discussing that in the Q&A, um, the factum would be distributed internally as a proofreading exercise. There we go. Uh, Kathy. Here's a little technical question for you. If we are in LexisNexis and we are under the lawyers daily section of the website, is there a search option purely within the lawyers daily or will it then expand into the search of the whole? No, that's that's a great question too. The the RSS feed on the Lawyers Daily uh, portal is actually going to take you if you link to one of those stories, it's going to take you to a separate URL because it's actually a separate product. That's just a little window into it. And the nice thing is that it's included in every Quick Law subscription, so you can read every new story. If you wanted to go back and search historical articles on the platform, you would. It, if you don't have a subscription, it would ask you, oh, do you want to start sign up for a trial? And it would let you do it through a trial. But you can read everything new as it's posted. So that's why it's a good thing to just check in each day and keep on top of it. Did that answer the question? 
I, I hope so. I hope the person who asked it is happy with that one. It sounds good to me anyway. But yes, it is searchable if you go to that URL. Exactly. And it will link you there. Perfect. I have another technical question for you, so don't mute yourself just yet. Um, Boolean search connectors. Do you have a magical guide on LexisNexis somewhere that will teach people how to do that? Because I know it's like a four hour course on <laughs> Booleans on their own right. So is there somewhere people can go and find out how to use these magical search terms? Yes, absolutely. And for people that aren't familiar with the term Boolean, it, it refers to terms and connector searching. That's where you're going to put your keywords in and you're going to put command language in between like an and command that says this word has to appear in every document and this word, or you might use an or command and this word has to appear, or it could be this word, a dog or a pet, for example, for a bite case. So yes, Boolean, there's a, a little advanced search click up above the red search box on the platform, or any of our tip sheets that I pointed to you from the, the bottom portal will give you lots of definition on that. We actually run uh, the training programs and you can ask specifically for training on command language or Boolean search strategy. And it makes your, your results list very precise because every result in your list will have to answer that command language. Whereas if you use the algorithmic or the natural language search, you'll get a much broader result, but it will capture more. For instance, if you typed in cannabis, it would know to pull up cases that said marijuana spelled with a J or marijuana spent with an H. So both strategies have value depending on what you're trying to do. But yes, there's definitely lots of help available through the platform and through our tip sheets from LexisNexis.ca. Perfect. Thank you. And also our tech support in the background are sharing the link for that in the chat box. So if you don't have the chat box open, open that, you'll find the links. And also, just as a little reminder for you all, you will be getting an email after this session. It will have a link to the recording of this session. It will have a link to the slides from this session. And it will also have all of those magical links that Kathy was just talking about and that she mentioned earlier on in the presentation too. So don't panic, it will be there. You're all in good hands for this one. Uh, a question, Marco, for you is, and you touched on this briefly, was sub-issues, particularly around a legal memorandum. When is it appropriate to use sub-issues? Should they generally be avoided in favor of stating only the main issue? What's your thought? And this is personal, I think. I think it is. And I, I think you're a hundred percent right, Siobhan. Um, my personal preference is not to divide questions. Um, I, I get very wary of having to answer questions that are in six parts. Um, in fact, I know that I, with some trepidation, try to unsuccessfully answer uh, questions by judges in court in, in an appeal, for example, where they may ask me a question. Sometimes they'll do it in parts. And I, I tend to panic because it's too many questions. It's actually four questions disguised as one. Um, I find trying to respond in that way, sometimes it's inevitable. And you may have to divide your question into parts. If you find yourself doing that, though, I would step back, uh, step back and ask yourself, and this is particularly true in a factum, am I actually just asking another question? And if it's a separate issue, it should be addressed as a separate issue. Um, if you try to sort of layer complexity onto one issue, it starts to get confusing and I simply cannot think that way. Um, I find it far too complex. My brain can't handle that much information at once. Great answer. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, I do think it's very personal though. Um, and I think it very much depends on the type of question you're being asked because sometimes the question that you're faced with will need to be broken down into subheadings in order to explain it. But you know, start with the big question and then figure it out afterwards. And I think follow Marco's tips that he showed earlier on, which is, you know, keep it general and then you can narrow down once you know what it is that you're actually searching for. And it may be that you do several rounds of legal research on a particular question as you actually drill down to what it is you're looking for. Um, at least that's my very limited experience of legal research as a solicitor not the best person to be answering that question that's for sure <laughs> um i had another question in here which was a really technical one kathy i apologize is there a possibility of using exclusion keywords which prevent results containing a certain keyword from dis displaying i think this is taking the bullion yes. to a whole new level <laughs> 
Absolutely. There is a not command in the in the Boolean language. I always caution people from using it because often I, I encourage people to do positive narrows or search within to, to narrow your data set. Because if you use a not command, which you could say British and not Columbia, you, you have to be careful because if it was a 45 page document, it said, um, I went on a trip to Columbia on page 45 and you might lose that document. So the not command is very powerful, but in the right place it can be used very effectively. So you have to think about the command language, what you're asking the system to do and build your search accordingly, so. Absolutely, think of Booleans in the same way that you would with creating a formula in an Excel document. And if you put the bit in the wrong place, you're gonna get no answer. <laughs> I think it's how I try and think of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Marco, flipping back to you, do you need to address the counterpoints arguments in your factum and to disprove them? Or are you only focusing on the merits of your client? And if you do address them, how do you do that? And in which part of the factum? Thank you. That's actually a brilliant question. Sorry, I didn't address that. Um, it's actually a very good point. You must address the counter argument. If you don't, um, you will leave the trier of fact utterly perplexed. Like, what's your response to this? Great, your arguments are wonderful, um, but how are you countering them? So absolutely, you must address them. You must also address, generally, any appellate decision or Supreme Court of Canada decision that is not favorable to you, and you should distinguish it straight away, um, because that will become a problem um, certainly for the lawyer that's arguing the case or uh, for you if you are arguing the case. Um, and in terms of the structure of your argument, it's critical to sort of explain why a particular Supreme Court of Canada decision on its facts does not apply. Where to include this? That is the money question. Um, and I struggled with this for many years in practice. And I think I, think I have a solution that works for me. And it's this. I set out my narrative first. This is why my client is right on the law. This is why our facts apply to this law. And this is why our client's case has merit. After I've done all that, then I take the counterpoints. If I'm, if I'm drafting a responding factum by way of example, I will then take out the appellant's argument and I will start to deconstruct them one by one and explain to the judge why they're wrong. But what I've done at that point from a rhetorical perspective is that I've explained why my client's position is right first. Now, hopefully, I have the judge on board, and it's at that point that I can begin to dismantle opposing counsel's arguments. Um, so I don't want to start with opposing counsel's arguments. I would never begin that way because it puts you on the defensive. It makes you look like you have a big problem and you need to address it straight away. And even if you do, which may legitimately be the case, Set out your narrative first. Explain why you are the winner of this case. And then once you've gotten through that, you can begin one by one to explain why the other side's argument is just irrelevant or it's misguided um, or it's immaterial. Fantastic. I love that. It's come from a, from a position of strength with your own argument and then tackle the other side's um, reasoning and why it isn't correct in this instance or why you believe it isn't correct in this instance. Great answer. So this is a question for both of you and Kathy, in your many years of teaching experience and teaching lots and lots of students as well, as well as the practical experience you've had um, and Marco in your own experience, how do you know when you've done enough research? When do you know it's time to stop? <laughs> Just from a research, I'll, I'll speak to that from Quick Law. The, the librarians and, and the librarians in the firms are such knowledgeable individuals because they deal with so many areas of law. The answer that we used to give is if you keep getting the same answer, you're doing multiple searches, you're attacking things from different sides, you're reading different books, and you're kind of always coming back to the same case or the same concept or the same, then you know you're getting close. When you're doing, I'll let Marco speak to <laughs> when you're creating new law, but you really never know if you found everything. You really don't. It's But that's the nice thing about the online platforms. So much more is at your fingertips. You can imagine when this was all in print years ago, so many precedents weren't followed. You didn't ever know if you had the right ones, and I'm sure we... <laughs> think about that a lot. I 100% agree with Kathy. I think everything she said is right. Um, that seems to be my experience as well. Remember that legal research 
to a certain degree, there is a methodology and Kathy and I have tried to show you how best to execute it. There, there is an element of luck to it. Um, at the end of the day, sadly. And sometimes you do miss things. I miss things. We all miss things. We're human. Um, it's going to happen. But to Kathy's point, I know I'm done when I keep on hitting the exact same case. And when Smith and Jones keeps on showing up it, after every Boolean search I can possibly think of, after I've read every secondary source, and I've realized, okay, this issue is Smith and Jones. Um, so I'm going to note up Smith and Jones. Once I've done that, um, I think it's time to throw in the towel and call it a day. There you go. Two people with the same answer. So I hope that answers your question um, on that one. A uh, couple of sort of technical drafting questions here, and you may have some input on this one, both of you, is um, if you address the counter argument in the factum, how does that differ from a legal opinion? So I think here we're looking at who the intended audience is for what we're providing and the situation in which we're providing it. Marco, do you um, Kathy, do you want me to take this, I guess? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I, I think the only distinction is this. In a legal opinion, when I've got a counter argument, um, I'm gonna be candid with the client. If I honestly believe that that counter argument has significant merit and it's a problem, I will let the client know. In a factum, that that very argument may be the same, may have the same sort of level of problematicness, if you will, um, uh, as compared to, to my arguments, but I'm going to address it in such a way as to distinguish it straight away, um, set out my arguments first, and then try to minimize it as much as possible. Not in a way that, of course, you are misrepresenting to the court, that would be contrary to your professional obligations, um, but in such a way that you're not giving it the prominence that it deserves, either because the case or the counterargument is distinguishable on its facts um, or has no application to your client's case. Um, so I'm not saying to be less candid in the factum, you have that goal, but you're more rhetorical in a factum because you're trying to advocate for a particular position. There you go. Uh, another one for you, Marco. Um, you mentioned in your presentation earlier that you would then pass on your legal writing to somebody else, or you may get somebody else to do the first round of the legal research for you. Um, how much would you rely on that research by somebody else? And would you then go on and do your own legal research. So I think this comes down to sort of your mentoring and your um, trust relationship that you have with your teams. And how much of your own research would you then do before you start drafting? That's actually an excellent question. Um, it really depends on what I've gotten and how many questions I have after I've read it. Um, so nine times out of 10 with, you know, there are only certain issues in a, in a 15 year career that seem to crop up repeatedly. If I notice that something really big is missing, then I may have concerns and will go off and just do my own research um, to take the, I keep on landing on the injunction example, so I apologize. But, um, you know, if suddenly RJR McDonald is not in that memorandum, I'm going to be a bit concerned because I know it should be there. Um, so I may go off and, and do my own research. Nine times out of 10, however, I have absolute faith in the person who's drafting um, and what ends up happening is I end up refining my thoughts. And so suddenly the person who's drafted for me, and I'm very lucky, um, we have exceptionally talented associates in my department who are very keen and smart. And the same can be said of our articling students and our summer students. Um, so I will usually read what they have, but then I sort of generate questions or I start to think of the argument in a completely different way, or I read a case that they've landed on. I suddenly realize, wait a second, this is the most important case. And it might be at the end of the page. And suddenly I become too anxious and impatient to sort of ask them to redo it and go back. And I want to know what the case says. And if it in fact says what it says on that paper, we may win on this. So suddenly you find, I find myself back on quick law, noting it up myself, just because I need to have, in order to be able to get to that level, um, for example, of, of drafting a piece of advocacy, to get there, I need to be familiar with the material ultimately. Sometimes what I will tell students or younger lawyers is, I don't wanna see a memorandum at all. 
I want you to give me the five or six cases that you think are most relevant. I want you to email them to me and then we're going to have a Zoom call and you're going to talk to me about them. Um, and I don't sort of set it up as a law school examination. I, I, I don't want... I don't want the Socratic method gone amok to be the sort of context in which I conduct these, these types of uh, discussions. But I let them walk me through it because then at that point I can start to refine. And it may be that I want to go in and read the case at that point, or alternatively, I'll ask them to do follow-up research. There you go, everybody. There's a little insight into how Marco mentors and trains the next generation of litigators out in Toronto. Um, so I'm sure it's probably different for every single person when you're working with other people, but hopefully that gives you one example of how it's done. And we're also seeing how people are working virtually. So for those of you who aren't in a law firm environment right now, you're seeing how law firms are working um, with this virtual um, platform that we're all using and different ways that you can use LexisNexis into your legal research and writing um, tasks that you're being given. Um, so hopefully for those of you who are going into summer student positions soon, it's an idea of what you might get ahead of you. Um, we're rapidly running out of time. Um, I know it's getting late on the East Coast. It's getting very late for those of you who are joining us from outside of Canada. Um, so I'm going to go with, if you want to ask a question, get it in right now. Um, I have one more. And this could be for both of you, but we'll probably start with Marco and then Kathy, you can join in. But do you have any tips for how to write a critical case comment now? That wasn't talked about in our um, session. It's probably a whole session on its own potentially, but do you have any like top three or four tips that you could suggest? That's actually great. Um, and you will find that as a student or an associate, you will be called upon sometimes to provide brief, what we call pricey, uh, I might be dating myself and using that word. Um, but for oral argument, for example, one of my tasks, certainly as a younger lawyer, was to just do case summaries of every authority that we relied on so that the advocate who was presenting the case could simply look down at the book of authorities and say, oh, this is what this case is about, right? This is the argument that I need to make about this. So how did I go about doing that? One of the tips is keep the facts exceptionally concise. Um, in a case summary, if you're talking about the duty of honest contractual performance and how the other side was dishonest in the way that they perform the contract, when you're discussing the facts in that synopsis, talk about the dishonesty, um, get to the nature of the contract, talk about the dishonesty, and then immediately move to what was held and then the actual principles, which I typically number, like, this is the first reason that you need to know about this case. This is the second reason you need to know about this case. Um, and so I used to draft these quite often. Um, if you find yourself preparing that type of a case comment for oral argument, a little cheat sheet that I know the uh, lawyers who were ahead of me used to love was that I would basically take the major issue, the reason the raison d'etre of that particular case and why we were relying on it. And I would highlight it in yellow and bold because when they're presenting before court, they don't have a lot of time to actually look at, at the particular document. And it would say things like standard of review is reasonableness in block letters, bold, capital and highlighted um, so that they could see it. And they remembered that was why we were relying on that particular case. Thank you. And Kathy, do you have any tips of how to use Lex LexisNexis to do that, to prepare that? Um, we have a number of summary collections on there, so you can go and read and number them. They're written by different editors, so that's always useful. I mean, you're always reading between the lines, so you're going to get information from the noise. But just uh, if we can go back to tools a little bit, when you are work, working vir virtually, some of the online tools are very handy to know about. So on QuickLaw, you can highlight text, you can stick sticky notes or annotate text, you can copy and paste citations if you're dropping it into a memo or something or a brief. So there's lots of online tools that help you. And you can also share that with colleagues and you can set up sharing rules where you can edit each other's work or you can be notified when something has changed. So those kind of tools help when you're not just in the, the office next door. On behalf of Global Lawyers of Canada, on behalf of LexisNexis, and on behalf of Talking Mains, I want to give a very large thank you to Marco Falco for joining us, writing this presentation today. Kathy Hayhow, thank you for joining us and all of your tips and tricks. And I know you have so many more 
to give to us. So please do check out the training because there is oodles and oodles and oodles of things that you can learn to make yourself more efficient and get quicker results back. And to all of you for all of your questions, thank you so much for engaging with us. And we look forward to seeing you again.